I want to say praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, we certainly do thank and praise the Lord for his goodness and his mercy, his love and his kindness that he has shown toward us. We certainly do thank the Lord for, as I often say, this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. And we thank God uh, for you uh, tuning in and being with us on today. Um, I normally would go into a Bible study about the coming of the Lord and Jesus' passion. This is his passion week. We would talk about uh, his crucifixion and his suffering. Uh, but today the Lord has dropped on me uh, a different way to go and to help to encourage us to give us what we need uh, in this hour. So I want to go before the Lord in prayer. Once again, my name is uh, uh, Suffragan Bishop-elect Frankie L. Quinn of Christian Ministries of the Apostolic Faith Church. And we certainly do thank God for our leadership here and we thank God for also for our lovely wife and I thank God for the members of Christian Ministries and everyone that is uh, uh, friends of Christian Ministries we thank God for you so we want to go before the Lord in prayer uh, certainly do want to remember we want to remember uh, those first responders those uh, people who are working in the hospitals and all those others that are serving people in grocery stores and in uh, particular restaurants and things such as that, uh, working in different areas that they have to go to work in group homes and, and various nursing homes and all those other type of places. We're gonna pray for the Lord will continue to bless them and to cover, him, cover them with his precious blood. Also too, we want to uh, pray, pray for our success of our service on today that something be said and done to inspire us and to encourage our hearts as we, especially as we see the day approaching, amen, the day approaching representing the coming of the Lord. And that's what we should be preparing ourselves for, the coming of the Lord. So let us pray. Gracious Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, Lord. We just say thank you and we praise you for your grace, your mercy, your love, and your kindness. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come together one more time we ask you, Lord, that you bless each and every request that's been made known. Send forth your anointing, send forth your grace and your strength. Bless each and every soul under the sound of my voice. Hallelujah, Lord, give us what we need in this hour. We know that you are a provider. We know that you are a way maker. Hallelujah, Lord, Lord, cause our hearts and our minds to be stayed on you, to have your perfect peace. Uh, Father, we thank you and praise you, give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So I just want to uh, delve into um, our lesson on today, and we're going to be coming out of the book of James, James chapter number five. And uh, just by way of, of, of refreshing, uh, we talked last week out of the book of St. Mark, St. Mark chapter 13, and uh, specifically verse uh, 13, where Jesus uh, was answering the question of his disciples about when, what should be the sign of his coming. And uh, Jesus never gave them a real direct answer. He gave them a, a long answer that was roundabout. But in those first couple verses, Jesus uh, said that there was going to be wars and rumors of wars and things such as that. But notice what he said, the end is not yet. So he said that these things were going to be happening, um, but the end was not yet. But notice what he said, the he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And what Jesus was saying that you're going to have wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilences in the land, and you're going to have uh, certain situations that are going on in life. But he's saying, be prepared to endure those things uh, because no man knoweth the time or the hour when the Son of Man is going to come. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, endurance. And last week I gave you a definition of endurance. And we said that that definition of endurance means to last, the, the ability to continue without perishing the ability to last, the ability to continue 
without perishing. In other words, to be to to remain and to abide and to be able to sustain without yielding under the pressure of the force. That's what the word endurance means. And when you're enduring things, you're going to endure some unpleasant things or some difficult things through the process or through the situation. But you've got to be able to endure it, endure the hard things of life without giving, without giving up, without giving way, without breaking down. Sure, you may cry. Sure, it may, you may have some heartache. You may have some pain. But you never stop moving forward. You never stop uh, uh, pressing your way. In other words, you pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Uh, you dust yourself off and you keep on going. That's what endurance is. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. Because we're going to experience some things in life that, that may shake us. That may uh, get us uh, out of sorts, so to speak. But you've got to be able to endure it until the end. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about out of the book of James. Uh, it talks about the end of the Lord, the end of the Lord. And um, I'll get into that, what I mean by that uh, in just a second. But uh, there's a scripture in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. In fact, we have that particular scripture on our walls here. And that scripture says that the, the Lord says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, uh, to give you an expected end. And though that particular verse, that particular verse it, it, it connects with our Bible study on today. The Lord says, for I know the thoughts. I know the thoughts. The Lord's thoughts are his plans. In other words, the Lord is saying, I know the plans that I think toward you. I know the plans that I have for you. And notice what it says. Those are not thoughts or plans of evil. Uh, in other words, God doesn't have anything in his plan for you for disaster, for destruction, to cause you to fall by the wayside. But his plans are of peace. It's, it, it brings you well-being. And notice, and it says, to bring you to an expected end. And that's what we want to focus on tonight. What is the Lord's expected end for us? What is the Lord's expected end for us? It's his thoughts, it's his plans, and everything that we experience in life, uh, God allows it to work together for our good to bring us to his expected end. Hallelujah. In order to reach God's expected end, you've got to be able to endure. You have to be able to endure. So I want you to go with me uh, to the book of St. James, St. James chapter number five, St. James chapter number five. And I want to begin reading at uh, verse number seven, St. James chapter number five and verse number seven. Notice the scripture. It says, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth and have long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. And notice the scripture, uh, verse number seven, it says, uh, be patient, be patient, therefore. Anytime that you are experiencing anything with God, and you want God to operate and to move in your life, you have to be patient. The Bible talks about us being patient, uh, enduring, and, and it says tribulation worketh patience, patience, the ability to abide under pressure. And the scripture says, be patient therefore, brethren, notice, unto the coming of the Lord, unto the coming of the Lord, until the Lord comes, whether or not you want to look at that coming of the Lord 
as whether or not uh, be patient until he delivers you in this moment or you want to look down range and down, 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 down hill, so to speak, uh, when he delivers you in the rapture. But whatever, uh, how you want to put this verse, the Lord wants you to be patient until he comes. The Lord is going to come. The scripture says that Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. So being patient has to be in your mind. It has to be in your mind that I'm going to wait, as Job said, all of my appointed time until my change come. And I'm not going to allow anything to deter me, hallelujah, to distract me from patiently waiting on the Lord. And anybody that waits on the Lord, you're not just waiting for anybody, hallelujah, you're waiting on the Lord himself to perfect that which concerns you. You're waiting on the Lord to, to, to deliver you out of a circumstance or a situation where he himself can show himself strong. Hallelujah. So you got to wait on the Lord. So the Bible says here, he says, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Notice, he says, behold, take notice, the husband man waited for the precious fruit of the earth and have long patience for it until he receives the, lat, the early and the latter rain. So what James is saying here, he's, he's, he's telling us to be patient like a farmer. A farmer uh, is one that really uh, has to depend on God. He can do certain things or she can do certain things that, that they, they can do, but, but in order to receive a crop, they have to wait on God. They have to wait on God to provide the rain that is necessary for the seed to grow. They have to wait on God. There's some things that are out of our control, but everything is in the control of the Lord. So, so in order to, for you to allow God to operate and to move in your life, you have to wait on the Lord. The scripture says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So Joe, uh, uh, James is looking at uh, a, a farmer here. A farmer, they, they, have, they can plow the land and then they can sow the seed in the land. But they have to wait patiently for the seed to grow, to germinate, to, to, to pollinate, and to grow. And, 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 and in their waiting, they have to wait patiently. Uh, notice what he said, for the early rain and the latter rain. And uh, uh, in, in, in that time in the Bible, they focused in on two rainy seasons, that First rainy season was in October. In October, they, they planted the, the, the corn, they planted the wheat uh, because the rain came and softened up the ground from the summer. And then, you know, in the springtime, they had to wait for the rain to come for in the springtime so that, so that everything can be watered, so that in the process of time, they would be able to yield a crop. So what is he saying? He's saying that, that, that as, as you go through a process, everything that, that God has for his children, everything that God has for us, it has to go through a process. Hallelujah. And you have to be able to endure the process in order to bring forth. Hallelujah. In order to bring forth, you have to have the, in your mind that I'm going to endure the process. So notice what he says, be patient, hallelujah, uh, uh, therefore brethren, uh, uh, upon the coming of the Lord, behold the farmer, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. The, the farmer has to wait, hallelujah, if he's going to get a crop, if he's going to uh, receive a yield from what he has planted, he has to wait, he has to wait uh, I'll say it this way. He has to wait until God rains down on him or on his crop in order for it to produce. If you're going to uh, uh, produce anything for the Lord, 
Uh, if you're going to grow in the Lord, if you're going to mature in the Lord, you have to wait and go through the process. Now, I want to say this. A process has a beginning, it has a middle, and it also has an end. Thank you, Lord. Everything that is connected with a process has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And God has a expected end for us. And in order for an individual to reach the end, they have to start out in the beginning, they have to endure through the middle, and they have to come out on the other side toward the end. Hallelujah. So notice what he said. He says, be patient. Uh, be ye also patient. That's that verse number eight. Be ye also patient. Wait. Thank you, Lord. If you're going to endure, you've got to be patient. That's what endurance means. The ability to abide under the pressure. You've got to be able to stand. You've got to be able to hang on in there no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like. You've got to have it in your mind set that I'm going to endure whatever comes my way because I'm looking for an expected end. That's why James said in the beginning of his epistle, count it all joy when you go through divers temptations and allow patience to have her what? Perfect work that you might be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Thank you, Lord. Go through the process. Be willing to go through the process. Notice it said, be ye also patient. Now notice that word. It says, establish or establish your hearts. In other words, I just want to park here just for a second. When you're establishing your heart, that means you're setting your mind. You're setting your mind like a flint. In other words, like Paul said in his epistle, I am persuaded. Hallelujah. You've got to be persuaded that, that neither life nor death nor principality, nor things uh, coming, nor things yet to come, shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And that's what the mindset you've got to be of. You've got to be established. Established where? Established in the present truth, in the word of God. And you've got to root yourself and ground yourself in the word of God. So then, like Jesus said, he said, he said in, in, in the end of uh, Matthew chapter number seven, I'll show you who a wise man is who builds his house upon a rock. And those that built his house on a rock, though the storms come, though the winds come, the house does not fall because it was founded upon the truth. That's the rock, the truth, the truth that is in Christ Jesus. And, and that is what establishes your mind. You've got to establish your mind in truth. I want to say it like this. You literally got to bathe your mind in truth. Soak your mind in truth so that when the pressure hits like a sponge, all that comes out is truth. All that comes out is righteousness. All that comes out is the hope that you have in the word of God. Hallelujah. So that's what he means when he says, establish your hearts. In other words, also to that establish your hearts means to prepare yourself. You know, you can expect the, the, the I'm going to say it this way. You can expect uh, the best, but prepare yourself for the worst. You can expect great things to happen, but prepare yourself as though uh, bad things are going to endure for a long time. In other words, get yourself in order so no matter what comes your way, you're prepared. You remember the scripture where Jesus, uh, well, he taught in a parable about the five foolish and the five wise virgins, those ten virgins all together, and uh, they were all prepared themselves and went out for the bridegroom. They went out for the wedding. And only five of them, uh, they had enough oil in the lamp. And the five foolish, they didn't have enough oil in their lamp. And the bridegroom delayed his coming. Thank you, Lord. They thought they would have enough, the foolish ones, but the bridegroom delayed his coming. 
And notice what they said. They asked the wise, they said, hey, let us have some of your oil. And the wise said, no, 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 you're not getting none of my oil. Least there not be enough for us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, so, so you have to prepare yourself. A wise person prepares themselves not for the, the, the end of the race, so to speak, but they prepare themselves if they even have to go further. They prepare themselves for the long run, not, not short-sightedness. You don't, uh, if you're ever traveling to, 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 from here to Ohio or something like that, you don't just get enough gas to make it into Ohio. You fill up your tank uh, so that when you get to Ohio, you have enough gas to last or enough gas to endure for a while until you get to the gas station. That's preparing yourself. You've got to be able to prepare yourself for if the Lord comes today or if he doesn't come in 20 years. You've got to be able to endure. You've got to be able to last until he comes. Thank you, Lord. So that's what uh, preparing your heart means, establishing your hearts. Notice what he says. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The coming of Jesus, he's coming. Uh, the Bible says that he's, uh, he, he, he's, he shouldn't take the saints uh, unawares, but uh, and, and he's coming as a thief in the night. No man knows the hour or the time when he's coming. But you want to be ready. Thank you, Lord. You want to be ready for when Jesus does come. In order for you to be ready when Jesus does come, You've got to be able to endure whatever comes your way and go through whatever process God sends your way because the process is going to lead you to his expected end. So as we move forward, thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm going somewhere. Y'all stay with me. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to take my time just for a little bit because um, uh, what I'm about to say is, is, is good for the soul. Notice verse number nine, five, James five and nine. He says, grudge not against uh, one another. Grudge not against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. So what he's saying is, verse number nine, uh, verse number seven, uh, I'm sorry, verse number uh uh, nine, he's saying that we have to not grudge or, or, or grudge not one against another. In other words, he's saying, hold your judgment. Uh, when you're dealing with your brothers and your sisters, when you're dealing with people, hold your judgment. Hold your judgment. Don't be quick to speak, uh, be, but be slow to hear and, and, and slow to wrath. Uh, you got to be 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 not be judgmental talking about people and looking down on people. You don't know why people do what they do. I don't know why people do what they do. But I've always got to have a positive mind, a positive outcome when I'm thinking about others. In other words, I've got to give people the benefit of the doubt. Hallelujah. Judge not that ye be not judged. That's what that scripture means. And notice... He says, grudge not one against another, lest ye be condemned. Uh, when you're going through a process or when you're, when you're going through a, 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 a storm, I put it that way. When you're going through a process, certain things are going to be revealed. Uh, certain things are going to be made known. And we're going to get into that in a minute. And, 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 and your heart is what's in you is going to be revealed as you go through a process. So what he's saying is, don't be judgmental of others. If, don't, if you always got a, a mind that you're looking down on people, that you're expecting the worst out of people, that, that people are no good, uh, the Bible says, uh, don't do that, lest you also be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. God is 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 he knows your, all of your thoughts 
He knows your thoughts from afar off. He knows why you say what you say. He knows when you said what you said. In fact, he has a record. And the Bible says that every idle word that comes out of your mouth is going to be judged. So he's saying that in your patience, don't let it make you irritated and in your mood that, that you go off the deep end, that you start judging people and, and holding grudges against people because they didn't do what you expected them to do. You can't control other people, but you can control your emotions. You can control your actions. And that's what he's saying. When you're being patient, a, a patient person, they know how to quiet themselves. They know how to, the, to, 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 to speak to the, their own heart and to encourage their own heart so that they can possess their soul. The Bible says, in your patience, you possess your soul. In other words, don't let people uh, uh, get under your skin wherein uh, they're making you cuss, they're making you say bad things, they're causing you to uh, uh, think evil against them. Don't do that. Hallelujah. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. Hallelujah. The Lord is at hand. Uh, in other words, I don't have time to mess around with foolishness because Jesus can come around anytime. I don't, I can't, I don't have time to mess around being angry and upset with you. That's, I'm wasting time. For the Bible says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers against uh, spiritual wickedness in high places. So I can't focus in on, on, on other people and allow them to get me upset, get me angry. I got to focus in on the Lord. I got to hold my peace and allow the Lord to fight my battles. So therefore I can't hold grudges, can't be upset, can't be angry at people for the things that they do or don't do. All right? Thank you, Lord. And, and, and the process that God sends us through to get us to his expected end, they reveal what's in our heart. Uh, the, what God allows us to go through, it reveals what's in our heart. So I, I, can, I can try to fool myself, but I can't fool God. I may be able to fool my brother or my sister, but I can't fool God. God knoweth the heart. And everything is open and naked before the Lord. And let me go on to verse number 10. He says, take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering afflictions and patience. So uh, verse number uh, 10 and verse number 11, I'm going to work with together. And this really forms the crux of our Bible study on tonight. Notice what he says then in verse number 11. He says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So I'm going to focus in on that. Uh, verse number 10 and 11 uh, simultaneously together. Notice he says, take. He's looking uh, for an example. Take my brethren. He's talking about the prophets. The prophets, they had to endure quite a bit uh, as, as, as they begin to teach and as they begin to preach. And they had to actually live some things that, that God was trying to show his people. Uh, in other words, what he calls us today to be living epistles, to be read of all men. In order to get through God to God's expected end, you have to live through uh, uh, your sufferings. In other words, you have to develop testimonies for the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And as you live this life, God is going to establish you through his testimonies. If you read the book of Hebrews chapter number 11, we call it the Hall of Fame. And it tells you about Abraham, Moses, and, and Jacob. It tells you about all of those that have gone through a process and God brought them through the process to his expected end. And, 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 and those whom God uses, 
You can even look at Job. Uh, uh, Job went through a process. You can even look at Joseph. Joseph went through a process and his expected end was to be a deliverer for the children of Israel when they got into the land of Goshen, wherein God then would multiply them greatly. And then he would raise up a, a, a prophet, I'll call him a prophet, by the name of Moses. And then God took Moses through a process. Y'all know about Moses' life, his story. And let me go back to Joseph. You know Joseph's process before God really used him. Joseph was, uh, uh, he had visions and dreams of God. And then, and then as he had those visions and dreams, he told his father, he told his brothers, and they all rejected him to the point where they put him in a ditch. And then he was scooped up by the Egyptians. And then when he got to Egypt, uh, he was accused of, of, uh, of, of Potiphar's wife. And he had to go to jail. Thank you, Lord. And then while he was jailed, uh, he had to go through. A, he was forgotten about. He had, had God had given him the power to tell dreams, and he was forgotten about. He had to wait patiently uh, until God rescued him out of that prison. And then uh, uh, when when God used uh, uh, the the baker to bring him out uh, of the prison. The cupbearer, I'm sorry, to bring him out of the prison. Then God elevated him second in the throne only to Pharaoh. And through all of that, Joseph had to endure some hardness. He had to endure some rejection. He had to endure some pain. He had to endure some suffering in order to, for God to bring him to his expected end. And in that process, Joseph probably har harbored some hard feelings toward his brothers, but, but, but he had to work through that. Hallelujah, because God, his brothers is the one who he was preparing. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. His brothers who he was preparing the, 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 the land of Goshen for. Uh, those that rejected him, those that despised him. Does that sound like anybody to you? The rejected and despised. Uh, they sound like our Savior Jesus. He died on the cross for you and I. He was preparing a place for us. And the Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And so Joseph went through that process in order for him to be able to be a deliverer for his people. And then God raised up Moses when the children of Israel got, uh, uh, they swole up, so to speak. A lot of people were there and God raised up Moses and he went through a process. Y'all know about Moses killed that individual, grew up in Pharaoh's house. Uh, 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 when he killed the individual, he was on the run for 40 years. Uh, and then he had the experience with God in the burning bush. And then uh, 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 Moses had to confront his own insecurities. He had to confront his own inabilities. Thank you, Lord. And then God encouraged him all through it. Moses said, I can't speak. God said, I'm going to give up. I'm going to cause your brother Aaron to be a mouthpiece. Thank you, Lord. And he, and he, and he, you know, he was telling him all these things to encourage him. And Moses found out who he was. When I say found out who he was, meaning he found out all of his indiscretions, all of his weaknesses came out. When you go through a process with God, hallelujah, it reveals certain things within you. Uh, it shows you who you are. And if you confront those things, who you are, with God, with your inabilities, your weaknesses, God, uh, if you trust in God, God can build you up. He can make you better. My Lord, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So um, Moses went through a process. Daniel went through a process. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they went through a process. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Abraham went through a process. Isaac and Jacob went through a process. Everybody that God uses goes through a process. And guess what, my friend? You are not exempt. You're going to go through a process as well. So we see here then, when we're coming then to uh, our particular scripture, notice, uh, he says, we have spoken 
in the name of the Lord, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, meaning that they were his representatives. All those that will live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer some persecution, but no, rest assured, you are his representative. Thank you, Lord. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, prepared unto every good work. So we see here, he says here, uh, for an example of suffering affliction and patience. So all of those people that I, I, I named, the scripture says that they were examples unto us. Examples of what? Suffering huh? and, 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 and patience. Thank you, Lord. And that word patience equals persistence. In other words, when you go through what you go through, your suffering, you've got to be patient and persistent. The scripture says, be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Now, your labor is not in vain. Hallelujah. So, so, so the scriptures were written my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. They were written for our learning and our admonition. Thank you, to admonish us. That word ad admonition means to correct us. Thank you, Lord. So, and to encourage us. It has a dual purpose, to correct and to encourage. That's what the Lord does. He corrects us and encourages us. He corrects us and encourages us. He corrects us and encourages us because God has an expected end, because God has something in his mind. God has a plan for us, and God does not want to abort his plan. Thank you, Lord. That would show that he's weak. That would show that he, has, he doesn't have the ability. Thank you, Lord, but he has to prepare us for his plan. My God, hallelujah. So in that process of suffering, the process of going through is a part of the plan of God. So we see here then, in verse number 11, he says, behold, in that time you see that word, behold, I teach my class, always take notice that something spectacular is about to happen. In other words, it means pay attention. Thank you, Lord, pay attention. Hallelujah. He says, behold, we count them happy which endure uh, Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord uh, that it was very pitiful and of tender mercies. In other words, he says, you uh, know we call those people blessed. And that word happy means uh, blessed. It means to be happy, spiritually prosperous, favored of God. Those people who are blessed, are happy, are blessed, spiritually prosperous, and favored of God, who have, uh, 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 which endure, means who are steadfast and endure in through difficult times, through difficult situations. In other words, just because you're going through a rough patch, doesn't mean that you give up, that you throw in the towel, because God has something in mind. God is working for your good. And that's what he meant, meant earlier when he said, you've got to establish your heart. In other words, you've got to have your mind made up that you're going to cross the bridge before you get to the bridge. In other words, you've got your mind made up that no matter what it takes, I'm going to reach my destination. Sometimes, uh, there was some years ago when I was uh, uh, young, younger, obviously some years ago I was younger, thank you Lord, that, that, that I was driving, I was taking my family to Mississippi, and uh, we, were, we were in that process of going to Mississippi, and my mind was determined that we were going to go down there, see my auntie, and see a couple friends. And also, there was a church convention that was going on as well. So I had bought 
the station wagon and the, the engine went out on it. Not, not, not the carburetor, but the engine went out on it. So, uh, because I was so determined uh, that we had already had the car packed up and ready to go. And the engine went out. And what I did was, I found me an engine. Had the guy put the engine in. And, and it was either a couple days or the next day. It was crazy that I got in the car, packed the family out, went down there to Mississippi and came back. It wasn't only till afterwards I had done all of that that I thought about it. Drove them 17 hours down and 17 hours back and had that untested, untried engine. I'm like, man, what was you thinking? Thank you, Lord. But, but I was determined. I had my confidence in God that whatever happens, God was going to make a way. And because I had that mind, God blessed us. He allowed us to go down there. He allowed us to come back safe and sound. So I said that to say this, that when, you, when your mind is made up, you may come across some circumstances or some situations that may seem impossible. But if you put your confidence in God, if you put your faith and your trust in God, he specializes in the impossible. Because with all things, all things with God are possible. There's nothing with him that is impossible. Hallelujah. He'll make a way out of no way. So, so, so we're looking here then at the book of Job, chapter, verse, chapter number 5 and verse 11. He says, Behold, we count them happy uh, which endure. Those people who endure are, are blessed. Those people who endure are spiritually prosperous. Huh? They have God's favor. God, God strengthens them. God, God sees that they're, they're going through and they got a mind made up to go through. In other words, God will go before them and prepare a way. God, God will stand up in their circumstance, in their situation, so that it can continue to propel them to his expected end. So notice then the, the, that, that verse number 11. He says, you have heard, notice, of the patience of Job. You have heard then of the patience of Job. And the scripture says, and have seen the end of the Lord. That, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. And that's our Bible study on tonight. Uh, from here on out, I want to talk about to you about Job and the end of the Lord. The end of the Lord represents his intended outcome. God has an intended outcome for everything that he allows to happen in your life. God has an intended outcome for us. In other words, that scripture I read to you in Jeremiah, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. In other words, God knows the thoughts. His thoughts are, is his plans that he thinks toward us or he thinks toward you, saith the Lord. Plans of peace. In other words, plans bring you well-being. Thank you, Lord. God does not want to destroy us. The plans of God, they are meant to bless us and to, and to keep us. Thank you, Lord. And thoughts of peace and not of evil, not of disaster. Thank you, Lord. Nothing that God allows to happen in your life is meant to destroy you. Thank you, Lord. Now, notice, uh, not of evil to give you an expected end, the future and the hope of God. God is going to accomplish it. Now, I spent some time telling you all of that because I want to I get into uh, what happened with Job. Y'all know the story of Job. The Bible says that Job was an upright man. Uh, he eschewed evil. And uh, Job was the richest man in the East. 
Thank you, Lord. And he was righteous. He offered up sacrifices unto the Lord, uh, not only for himself, but for his children and for his family. And one day the devil had it in his mind uh, that uh, he, well, not now, I'm going to back up. Uh, uh, one day the devil presented himself uh, uh, before the Lord, so to speak. I'm going to speed up here. And, and the Lord asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to and fro. Amen. And he said, no, God said, have you considered my servant Job? Amen. Notice how he put it. Have you considered my servant Job? Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, so Job was God's servant. Huh? But he asked the devil, have you considered him? Because why would God say that? Because God had an expected end for Job. He had an expected end for Job. So in order for Job to reach his expected end, God created the devil to help in this process. Amen? Sometimes uh, the enemy is, is needed to help you to get to where you need to be. Thank you, Lord. So, so, so I know I'm, uh, I'm probably throwing a lot of people off doctrinally, but, but, but you need the devil. That's why the, devil, the Lord created him. Because the devil helps to reveal what's in you that God doesn't like. Or he helps to reveal in you what God loves. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So, so if, if you got evil and hatred in you, the devil will reveal it. And God doesn't like it. That's why he uses the devil. If you got love, peace, and joy in you, it will be revealed and God loves it. Here's what he wants. So the enemy helps to reveal what is in us. What is in us. So notice, God says he wants to give you the expected end. In other words, God has something for you, but you've got to go through the process in order for you to receive it, for God to give it to you. You've got to be able to go through the process. So Job was considered by God and Job lost everything. Y'all know the story. He lost his health. He lost his, his wealth. He lost his children. Uh, even, his, even his marriage was, got jacked up. Uh, his wife turned on him and his, his friends, they turned on him. Thank you, Lord. Job lost everything except for his faith in God, except for his faith in God. But there were some things that was in Job, and Job begins to question God. And as he begins to question God, Job uh, uh, kind of rose up in what I call a self-righteous spirit. Thank you, Lord. There were some things in Job that, 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 that were going on in him and in his mind as he was going through the process that the suffering had to bring out. Uh, the suffering that he went through, uh, it had to, it, it, it was made known by what he was going through. And Job had some, had, he had a confrontation with God. And Job, he cursed the day that he was born. He's, and he, and he, 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 he kind of went off the deep end, deep down in a depression because of what he was going through and what was upon him. And, and he then begins to question God about why did you make me thus? Why are you allowing me to go through this? Aren't I your righteous servant? Huh? And then, then notice, God spoke to Job out of a whirlwind. Uh, in other words, God spoke to Job out of a storm. Hallelujah. And, and the storm and that whirlwind, well, that, that which was needed to bring Job to his expected end. Now notice, in, in order to, to, to get us, in order to get to the end, I said earlier that you must go through the process. And the process, it, it literally reveals something in you. The process reveals something in you. Uh, the process, it literally humbles you uh, to let you know what is in your heart. It, it, it shows whether or not you're going to keep God's commandments and whether or not you love God. 
The process prepares you for the next level. The process prepares you for the next level. And the process is necessary to bring you to God's expected end. And um, the process also, what you experience, it literally brings you closer to God. What you experience literally brings you closer to God. Now, uh, in my few minutes that I have left, I want to I want to talk to you in a serious manner. When when Job was going through what he was going through, when Job was experiencing what he was experiencing, those experiences it 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 took him through a process where he had to acknowledge some things. When, when that storm was going, Job was going through that storm, that whirlwind, it, it revealed something in him. Now, a whirlwind, when we talk about a whirlwind, we're talking literally about a storm. We're literally talking about a, a, a wind, a hurricane or a tornado. And in the hurricane and the tornado, you see what, what, what the scientists call a vortex, which is that cone. And literally, what, what the wind in, uh, of that vortex does, it, it sucks things into its center. And that's what God does and how he uses storms. He uses storms in our life to, to blow those things away that, that are not stable and to literally suck us in to the center of his will. Uh, uh, when we, we're experiencing different types of storms, different types of storms, they, they, they are meant to suck us in to God. That's what, that's what those, uh, uh, the vortex or those natural storms do. They, they suck people in, they suck things in to the middle. And that's what God uses those storms, the storms in our life, to suck us in to the center of his will. And the thing about storms, I learned that storms come at any season. They come at any time. The storms in our lives, the things that we experience, they come at any season. They, they can come at any time. And when we are experiencing a storm, uh, it's meant to suck us in to the will of God. Like the storm we're facing now with this coronavirus. It's not meant to destroy us. Thank you, Lord. But it's meant to suck us in and get us closer to the Lord. It's meant to get us closer to Him. Now, not only is it meant to get us closer to Him, but it's also meant to reveal some things in us to prepare us to the next level. Uh, I, I was talking to somebody today. They were saying that, that through this, when we come out of this, nine months later, there's going to be a lot of babies. And then the other person said, yeah, when we come through this, there's also going to be some divorces, a lot of divorces. So, so, so people are going to get to know one another, either in a good way or a bad way, when they come through this storm. And it reveals something. It reveals our, the, 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 the cracks in our government. It reveals the, 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 the cracks in uh, our relationship, our hospital system. It reveals the cracks that are in our, our financial markets. It's revealing a whole lot. It reveals the, the resolve that, that people have concerning serving the Lord. That, that uh, uh, Lord, I love you. And I want to stay connected to you. So by any means necessary, I'm going to keep myself rooted and grounded. I'm going to, I'm going to read the word. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek your will because I don't want this storm to drive me away. Other people will say, hey, well, the church is out so I can have me a good time. I can do whatever I want to do. But, but that's not the purpose of this storm. The purpose of storms are to drive you into the will of God, bring you closer to him. And I want to say this, when you, 
when you're going through uh, a storm and you want to find out, Lord, I want to turn away my captivity. Lord, what, what is needed for me to come out on top? You got to ask yourself some questions. Like, Lord, what is needed for me to turn this captivity? When Job, when Job was coming through what he was coming through, God gave him a specific thing to do to turn away his captivity. And Job had to pray for the friends that he had. Uh, his friends were, uh, uh, if you read the book of Job, they were, they were questioning his righteousness. They were, they were condescending to Job. They weren't friends. They were acting like enemies. And then God rebuked, rebuked Job's friends. And then what had to turn Job's captivity was that he had to pray for those that hated him, that despitefully used him, that talked about him. Job had to pray for him, pray for his friends. And, and, and that caused him to have forgiveness in his heart. That caused him to have an abundance of love in his heart. And then the, when Job did that, God brought him to his expected end, which was to give him double for his trouble, to bless him exceedingly and abundantly. When Job did what God had revealed to him to do, thank you, Lord, Job then was blessed. When, uh, when you're going through your storm, You've got to ask God, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what are you trying to show me through this? And, and, and you've got to be honest of it, a sincere heart. That means you've got to literally go to God in prayer and lay before his face on a regular basis while you're going through your storm to get what God has for you, what he's trying to reveal to you. Because what he wants to reveal to you is important. It's necessary. If he wasn't, he wouldn't allow the storm. Then you got to ask, say, Lord, what? Uh, ask the Lord, what is the Lord trying to get you to see? What is the Lord trying to get you to see? What is he trying to get you to see? And get your focus off of things that don't count. But put your focus on things that do count. Oftentimes we get involved, I'm just saying, with relationships that take us away from God. That distract us. Things distract us. As God, through this storm, trying to reveal to you things that are important. And you got to ask yourself, Lord, what are you trying to get me to see? Ask the Lord, what? What are you trying to reveal in me? Lord, what are you trying to reveal in me? Hallelujah. The Lord is always trying to reveal and to show us something. Lord, what are you trying to reveal in me? Then you have to ask yourself, Lord, what are you trying to get me to understand? What are you trying to get me to understand? Hallelujah. Then you have to ask yourself, Lord, what, what are you trying to change in my life? The Lord wants us to change some things, brothers and sisters. And we have to ask the Lord, Lord, what are you trying to change in my life? When we come through this, we should be better. We should be stronger. We should be well equipped to endure. And we have to ask the Lord, Lord, what are you trying to change? What do you want me to see? What do you want me to do? Why? Uh, uh, to, because the Lord has an expected end. Hallelujah. And he's trying to bring you to his end. Now, with Job, when Job went through, when Job, that whirlwind that Job experienced, and after Job had experienced the whirlwind and God started naming off, because Job thought he was greater than God. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Hallelujah. And he got Job. I like what God said. I'm going to take my time here just for a minute. God, God, Job was trying to change, uh, make, Job was trying to make his righteousness above the righteousness of God. In other words, Job was trying to say that, God, I'm righteous to, to nullify the righteousness of God. People do that. In other words, 
people take scriptures and, 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 and twist the scriptures to make them fit their situation to prove that they're, to try to prove that they're righteous and just. And that's what Job was doing. He was trying to change uh, uh, the, 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 the word of God, trying to change and manipulate the character of God to exalt himself, to make himself more righteous. My Lord, Job learned something about himself. And Job said, after God got through saying, Look, Job, where were you when I hung the moon and the stars? Job, he went to two chapters, went on and on, and, uh, uh, asking Job, where were you? Do you have this kind of knowledge? Are you able to do this, Job? And then Job said, well, I spoke once, but I won't speak again. Hallelujah. So Job, he, he, he learned through the storm how to acknowledge God's greatness. In other words, Job knew that God was great. But when he came out of what he came out of, he knew that God was greater, hallelujah, than what he expected. He knew that God was greater and exceeded his own wisdom and knowledge and understanding. When we come through what we're coming through, we've got to recognize that God is greater. Hallelujah. He's greater than any circumstance. He's greater than any virus. He's greater than, than any, any court system. He's greater. Hallelujah. He's greater. Thank you, Lord. He's greater than poverty. He's greater than sickness. He's greater than disease. God is greater. And when you learn that God is greater, you, you, you learn it because he brings you closer to him. The storm is meant to bring you closer till you can get a greater perspective of who he is. Thank you, Lord. And then Job made a confession of his ignorance. When you're in a storm and you come out of a storm, you should be able to understand, Lord, man, I was ignorant on some things. Uh, hallelujah. I didn't know as I ought. Thank you, Lord. When, when God reveals to you how, how small and how little your thoughts are compared to his thoughts, that ought to make you rejoice. Thank you, Lord. Job said, I spoke once, but I won't speak again. Thank you, Lord. Job recognized that he was ignorant. Thank you, Lord. And, and being ignorant, that's not, that's not a, a condescending term. That just means you don't know. Hallelujah. There's a lot of things I don't know. Hallelujah. Job said, God, your word is too wonderful for me. Huh? Your word is too high for me. Hallelujah. He was realizing and exalting the word of God. Hallelujah. And Job was acknowledging his ignorance. When you come through a storm, hallelujah, you should be able to acknowledge some ignorant things or some ignorant thoughts that you had in your own mind. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Job, Job, through that storm, he got humbled. Amen. He got humbled. When we go through a storm, thank you, Lord, the storm is meant to humble us. Job humbled himself and he submitted to the will of God. Thank you, Lord. My God, you got to humble yourself and submit to the will of God. And then Job, he, had, he, he appreciated God more because of what he went through. When Job came out of his storm, he appreciated God more. Uh, than what he went through. Now that's saying a lot because Job had already had an understanding with God. Job had already, was what the Bible says, he was mature, perfect, walking upright. Thank you, Lord. But, but, but Job didn't have a full knowledge, a full understanding. Though uh, uh, you, can, you can never reach a pinnacle with God. In other words, we are never on God's level. His, his, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. It's like God's word. God's word is ever revealing. God's word is ever revealing. And no matter how, how, how great you are in God or how far you up are in the ladder with God, you'll never reach a place where you can be equal with God in the sense of his knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. So Job 
realize because he must have thought that he was walking on the same plane with God. Hallelujah. So anytime you think you're walking on the same plane with God, you get ready to get knocked down. You get ready to, 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 to suffer some things so that God can show you where you are concerning him. So Job, thank you, Lord, he went through. And, and the key to his lesson was his submission to God. Now, in my conclusion, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. Thank you, Lord. Uh, uh, the way to turn away from your captivity, the way to endure your tests, the way to endure your trials, you've got to be submitted to God. That's the end of life. Whatever I'm going through right now or in the middle or in the end, I've got to be submitted to God. I've got to obey and trust the Lord. If you're going to endure, you've got to endure being submitted to the Lord. Submission comes. Happiness, I'm going to say this, happiness for the human soul, thank you Lord, should not be our end goal. Me trying to do things to make me happy, that's overrated. Thank you, Lord. Me trying to satisfy my flesh, satisfy my soul, uh, that's overrated. I should be more focused on uh, uh, living a lifestyle to be submitted to the will of God. Because my happiness, it can conflict with the will of God. And that's what, that's what, that's what entered Job's mind. Job was doing things to be happy. Job was doing things to, 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 to you know, to, to live a certain lifestyle. But God wanted to show him that it's more to life than that. Hallelujah. It's more to life than just trying to be happy. Hallelujah. But the, the, the object or the goal of life should be to be submitted to God, to do his will. That's where true happiness is. I can see uh, uh, buy me a car, that'll make me happy for a little bit. Buy me a house, that'll make me happy for a little while. Buy me a, a suit, that'll make me happy for a little while. Give me a meal, thank you, Lord. I give me a happy meal, thank <laughs> you, Jesus. That'll make me happy for a little while, but it's not sustaining. It doesn't satisfy the soul. Hallelujah. True happiness comes from submitting to the will of God. The safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. Hallelujah. So, so I've got to consider the end, the end of the Lord. The end of the Lord, when I'm going through storms, is where does God want me? What is God trying to do in me and through me? What is God trying to show me? Thank you, Lord. As we go on, through this, we coming out of this. Thank you, Lord. I like what David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear any evil, for the Lord is with me. Amen. Hallelujah. We got to understand that the Lord is with us. And as we go through this, thank you, Lord, and come out on the other side, uh, we should come out better. We should come out stronger so that we can embrace the Lord's expected end. And I want to thank and praise God uh, for you all, for you all tuning in, uh, uh, being with us on today. And as we get ready uh, for Good Friday coming up, I want you to pray, seek God. Thank you, Lord. Fast, call on the name of the Lord. Amen. And be prepared for Easter Sunday. Though uh, we not all be together, it's going to be different. Thank you, Lord. But that's part of it. Hallelujah. What's, it's, it's revealing something in you. Uh, do you long to be with the Lord? And, and you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying to close up here. But I want to say this. And uh, it's been on my heart uh, for some months. Thank you, Lord. Especially when I'm teaching and I'm preaching and I, I, 
I look at the faces of the people to whom I preach and teach to, the thought I always go through my mind is, you know, uh, do they desire the things that are necessary from God? And if a person doesn't desire the things that God desires, they're living their life in vain. If one doesn't desire the things of God and holds those things to their heart as purposeful, then God, God, in other words, God is not going to pay any attention to them because they're not paying attention to him. Yeah, God will love them. God, God will bless them. But when it comes to the deep things of God, when it comes to relationship with God, when it comes to God revealing his innermost self to an individual, he's only going to do that to those who seek after him, to those that call on his name, to those that appreciate his revelations, his wisdom, his knowledge and understanding. In other words, those that esteem his word higher than his necessary food. Those that go after him and say, Lord, as the deer panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Those are the ones who will know him in the power of his might, through the fellowship of his suffering. Those are the ones that are going to be made conformable unto his death. Hallelujah. Those are the ones that are going to taste and see that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What, do you desire the things that be of God? Hallelujah. The scripture says in the book of Revelations, I'd rather that you were hot or cold, not lukewarm, or I'll spew you or vomit you out of my mouth. God would rather that you be hot, that you be fervent. Hallelujah. That you be on fire for him and the things that be of God. What do you mind? Where is your mind? What do you seek after? What do you call on? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. God does not want us to uh, live this life without, without seeking him in that right early. God doesn't want us to live this life as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, 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 a butterfly. Don't care where you go. Uh, don't care what you do. God wants you to live this life for him. Hallelujah. Then he'll turn around and turn around your captivity. Ah, oh, amen. So let us prepare ourselves. <laughs> let us prepare ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for Easter. Get our minds wrapped around the fact that we're going to be apart, but yet we're going to be together. We're in the body of Christ. Let us get ourselves together. Trust in the Lord. I'll be back on the air, Lord will, and 9.30 on Sunday morning for Sunday school and then at 11 o'clock uh, for our Easter message. Pray for me and I'll pray for you and we'll pray for one another. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.